So last week we talked, we started a series about the seven churches in Revelation chapter 2 through 3. We looked at one church, the Ephesus church, and we referred to that as a distant church. They had a lot of good things going for them, but they have forsaken their what? Their first love. That means we can do all the stuff of church, but if we don't love Jesus, all of that is pointless, right? Right? Okay, so today we're going to be looking at four churches, and these, if I were to group them all together, these are all churches that went through suffering. So I don't have a lot of time to waste, so we're going to jump right in there, and we're going to begin with the church of Smyrna. Now, you'll notice in the categories that in each one of these churches, God does something similar, okay? So one of the categories is the revelation of himself. So how does Jesus reveal himself to the church of Smyrna? It says in chapter 2, verse 8, These are the words of him who is the first and the last. He was there at the beginning, and he will always be. And this is the part I want you to really focus on, because this is important for what he's going to say to the church. Who died and came to life again. He died on the cross for us, and he rose on the third day. But keep that in your mind. Who died and came to life again. And I want you to begin to think in your mind, why would Jesus reveal that part of himself to this church? You're going to find that out. So if you're taking notes, you're going to write down under the section of Smyrna, the revelation of the church, first and last, and died and rose again, the revelation of Jesus. Now let's move on to what were some of the good things that were happening in the church. He says in verse 9, I know your afflictions. Okay, so here's the start. This is a church that's being persecuted for their faith. I know your afflictions and your poverty. Uh, So there are some places in the world even today that if you claim to be a Christian, you might lose your job. Uh, People may, if you're selling stuff, people may not buy from you. And I believe in this uh, church, in this city, that's what was happening to believers Uh, For some reason, they are suffering and they don't have any money in their wallet. But yet, he says, yet you are rich. Okay, so for some people, they think that being a Christian means that God is going to bless your life, that you're going to have a new car, new yacht, new plane, right? How many of you have your new plane? None of you? Y'all must not be good Christians. (laughs) Now the truth is, Jesus said we would go through suffering. We would face trouble, right? So just because you are poor doesn't mean that you are wrong in a wrong relationship with God. You can be poor and yet be rich. So how were they rich? Okay, in the eyes of the world, they didn't have money. Maybe they didn't have a roof over their head or maybe they didn't have the food that they wanted to have. But they had Jesus. Okay, can you compare this earthly stuff to an eternity with Jesus? You realize that you are rich. So that's what he said of this church. They were rich in him. Now, we're going to look at the bad in the church of Smyrna. Are you ready? We just had it, okay? Jesus doesn't say anything bad about the church of Smyrna. And I think that's important. They're going through a difficult time And so he's not going to burden them with anything. But he does have a command for them. And we see that in verse 9. I know about the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. He kind of eased those words in, didn't he? (laughs) Can, Can you imagine being called a synagogue of Satan? That's pretty strong words. What is he talking about? Okay, so there were Jewish people. The Jewish people were the people of God, right? Nod your head. I want to make sure you're with me. Okay, they are the people of God. There were some Jews who received Jesus. Now, who is Jesus? He is the Son of God. He is God. He's part of the Trinity. So, if you are the people of God, but yet you reject God, do you think that's a problem? I don't think you're the people of God if you reject God. So here he says, there are some who are Jews. Yes, they are the chosen people, but yet they haven't received God. And matter of fact, they're working on the other team. They are of the synagogue of Satan. 
And here's what he says, verse 10. Do not be afraid. Let's just stop right there. Isn't that encouraging? If you're about to suffer, uh, go through suffering, and the word to you, Regan, is don't be afraid. And in a minute, you're like, oh, thank you, Lord. That's good. But then you keep reading, don't be afraid of what you're about to suffer. And you're like, wait, wait, wait a minute, God. You mean you're not going to rescue me out of this? You mean I'm going to be brought to court and I'm going to lose everything? You mean I'm going to be thrown in prison? You mean I'm going to be put in this box out in the sweltering heat? You mean you're not going to rescue me out of this? What does he say? Don't be afraid of what you are about to suffer. So the command is, go ahead and write this down, don't be afraid of suffering and testing. Now for some people, and this is where we get off when it becomes in the American church, we have this view of God that if you become a believer, everything is going to be perfect. You are never going to suffer anything. And you know what the problem is? When people begin to suffer, what do they do? God, how could you let this happen? You must not be real. And they distance themselves from God. But God said, in this world, you will have trouble. So don't be afraid of suffering and testing. Let's finish this verse. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you. And you will suffer persecution for ten days. Now, uh, during the second and third centuries of Roman rule, there were ten big periods of persecution. Now, these were very short bursts, but yet the persecution was so bad that millions of Christians were burned at the stake, they were thrown to lions, they were tortured and killed in many terrible ways. And so what is Jesus doing here? He's talking to the churches and saying, You are going to have to go through this suffering, but don't give up. Don't be afraid. Verse 10 continues, be faithful even to the point of death. Now, shortly after Revelation was written, there was a disciple of John and a few of the other disciples, and his name was Polycarp. And he became the bishop of the church of Smyrna. Now, he was eventually murdered by the Romans, and when when he refused to denounce Christ... But you know, you remember, remember what was said of the synagogue of Satan? Guess who happened to bring the wood to burn Polycarp? Polycarp. Yeah, there it is. Polycarp. It was the Jewish believers that had rejected Christ. They were the ones that brought the wood to burn him alive. Okay? So you can see this is something that was fulfilled even in Polycarp. But the command is this, be faithful even to the point of death. So go ahead and you can write that down in your notes. Now, how can we be faithful to the point of death? Does serving God make sense if you are going to lose your life to serve God? Let's continue on and read. Now, what were the consequences to Smyrna? Are you ready? You just heard them. There's no consequences. He doesn't talk to them about the bad things in their church. He doesn't face them with the consequences. Why? Because I believe that he knows that they're suffering and his focus to them is simply, you need to stay true. So let's look to the promise of the overcomer. Verse 10, Be faithful even to the point of death and I will give you life as your victor's crown. Now when we think about crowns, we usually think about a king's crown. But here, this is the victor's crown. Uh, In that time, you know, they would run races. Instead of being given a trophy, they would have this wreath that would be placed on their head. And it was a thing of honor. So I want you to kind of picture the Olympics. You know, when they get on the stand and there's crowds cheering, you know, and they have the wreath on. That that is what that's talking about. And so what he's saying, you know what your crown is going to be? Your life. And that's speaking of eternal life. If you are willing to stand for me, even to the point of death, you're going to get to experience eternal life with me. And you'll be honored in that life. So if you're taking notes, the promise to to overcomer is a crown of life. If we continue in verse 11, it says, The one who is victorious will not be hurt at all by the second death. Okay, so is God going to spare him from the first death? 
No, they were going to have to walk through that. But the second death, which is speaking of hell and eternity in the lake of fire, separation from God, they would not have to face that. They would have eternity in heaven. So not to be hurt at all by the second death. Now, how did Jesus reveal himself to the church of Smyrna? Does anybody remember? You can look at your notes. Who, what, and what? Who died and rose again. Why do you think that Jesus revealed himself to that church that way? Because they were going to have to die, right? And his promise to them is just like I gave my life and I rose from the dead, you may have to suffer to the point of death, but you are going to have eternal life. I love how that fits together. Let's go ahead and move on to the second church. Can you say Pergamum? Pergamum, Pergamum, Pergamum. I did it three times in a row. That's good. Let's look at the church of Pergamum and how did Jesus reveal himself to Pergamum? It says, To the angel of the church in Pergamum write, These are the words of him who has a sharp, double-edged sword. Now, do you like swords? Are swords a good thing? It depends, right? Swords are a great thing if somebody is attacking you and you've got somebody that knows how to use a sword and they are on your side, right? They're a great thing. But if you are on the other side of a sword and they're fighting against you, that's a scary thing, right? So in this context, uh, context, Jesus is saying, I've got the sword. And the question is, are you on the right side of that sword? He has a sharp, double-edged sword. Let's look at the good things of the church of Pergamum. Now, this is, this is pretty crazy. I know where you live, where Satan has his throne. So Pergamum was the Roman capital of Asia. They had this great altar to Zeus, who is the chief Greek god, and this elegant temple of the goddess Athena, uh, for her, and outside the city wall was the shrine to the Greek god of medicine who just happened to appear in the form of, can anybody guess? A serpent. Okay? So this was a major place of false religion, of false gods. And there were Christians in this place where all of this is going on. And maybe to get a picture of this, Maybe go to a place uh, where you would be afraid to live, all right? If we were to go right in the heart of a Muslim city, imagine the, you know, that persecuted Christians, it would be really hard to have a church there, right? And then I want you to think about another thing. Have you ever walked into a place and you can sense the heaviness there and you know that there is something spiritual going on right in that place? I know I went on a mission trip one time to Ecuador and we walked into this one area and I could just sense there was just like this heaviness that was in, the, in that place and I actually had to walk out. But can you imagine living and having a church in a place where the devil has set up his headquarters, right? Where Satan has his throne. So this church, Pergamum, was right in the middle where Satan had his throne Yet they remained true. That is a true testament. So if you're taking notes, remain true even though surrounded by evil. Verse 13 says, You didn't renounce your faith in me, not even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness. So he bore witness to Jesus, who was put to death in your city where Satan lives. How many of you would like the, that to be put on your town sign? Where Satan lives. <laughs> Yikes, is right. So they did not renounce Christ even in the face of death. So that was good. They stayed strong. Even though they're surrounded by evil all around them, they stayed strong. But there was some bad that he dealt with with Pergamum. And we see it in verse 14. There are some among you who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin so that they ate food sacrificed to idols and committed sexual immorality. So if, you're, if you remember, King Balak basically used pretty girls and sexual immorality to entice the men of Israel away from God. 
So what I want you to picture in your mind is you've got believers who love God, but they're living in this place of absolute wickedness. Everybody in their town is going to this area, to the, the temple of of Athena or to this one of Zeus or to this one of the serpent god. And they're like, hey, come on, we're having this big festival. There'll be food, games, and the girls are amazing and all of these things. And they are luring the people away. And some of the Christians there were like, well, I don't even think that those gods are real. They're not even real. So does it really make a difference if I go and have food with them? If I get in part in this, you know, Jesus died to forgive me of all my sins. I can do these things too, right? And so they go to these big parties and partake of them. Likewise, you also, and you need to understand, part of these parties were they were offering sacrifices to these false gods. So likewise, you also have those who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Now, you remember we talked about them last week with the church of Ephesus. Basically, they were people that believed, they didn't believe in worshiping idols, or wasn't a part of that, but they did think having sexual immorality was okay and being a part of that. And so this is something against, something against the church. So if you're taking notes, go ahead and write, the bad about this church was idol worship, And not everybody did this, but there were some in the church who did. Same thing, sexual immorality. Now, I want you to think about uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 21 says this. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons too. You cannot have a part in both the Lord's table and the table of demons. So do you... Do you understand the symbolism here? You know how we once a month we celebrate the Lord's Supper, right? That is a partaking of Him. And so we had believers in this church who would go and partake of the Lord's Supper and then they would go and partake of Satan's Supper. There's a problem of that. Just like we partake of Him, we are partaking of Satan and his worldly ways. So it just does not mix. So what was the command to the Pergamum church? Really simple, repent. Okay, If you are getting involved in sexual immorality, if you are worshiping God but also worshiping other things, repent, change your direction. You can go ahead and write that down. What were the consequences if they did not repent? Here comes the sword again. Remember how you want to be on the good side of the sword? Otherwise, I will soon come to you and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Okay, so do you, do you see the picture that he paints to the church? Okay, here you are. I'm the one who holds the sword. You're getting involved in this sexual immorality, this, this false idol worship. This sword is pointed towards you if you don't repent. Now, what was the purpose of this? Because Jesus wanted to kill them? No, what did he want? Repent. He wanted them to see the seriousness of the situation and repent. So, this is the Word of God. It's a mirror. We look in it and we see ourselves. So when you're looking in this mirror, can that be said of you? Maybe you're here at church. You believe in God. You love God. You've partaken of the Lord's Supper. But are you involved in sexual immorality in your life? The point of the sword is not to kill you here today. The point of the sword is to repent. Now is the time to change. Thank you. And the point is this. It's not okay. Even if they're not really gods, it's not okay. God will not overlook when you are living unfaithfully. So the consequence, I'll fight against them with the sword of my mouth. What is the promise to the one who overcomes? The one that everybody is saying, come and be like us. Come and be a part. Oh, this this is not that big of a deal. Just come and do this. For the one who resists, who overcomes that temptation, verse 17 says, to the one who is victorious, I will give some of the hidden manna. You know what Jesus is called? He is called the bread of what? Life. Okay, so there's this big contrast between the Lord's table and partaking of Him 
and the table of wickedness of Satan. And here's the promise to the one who rejects that feast, the evil feast. I'm going to give you a better feast, me. You're partaking of him. And the other thing. Now, what if you are here today and you are involved in sexual sin? You're involved in idol worship or something else, other foreign gods. And you're here today and you repent and say, God, I don't want to live this anyway, way anymore. I want to follow after you. You overcome in that moment. And here's what you were promised. I will also give that person a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to the one who receives it. Okay, I want you to, for a minute, uh, picture yourself in a courtroom, and you are on the stand. You're about to be convicted or let set free, and there are these 12 jurors on the other side, and they've got to give a verdict. But instead of one person standing up and saying the verdict, they all have something. They either have maybe a black stone or a white stone. And that white stone represents not guilty. And so in that time, to put that white stone out represented not guilty. Okay, so here's the message of Jesus to them. If you will repent, if you will change, I'm going to give you the white stone, the not guilty verdict. And all... You know, when we sin, we get labels on us. When you lie, you become a what? When you cheat, when you steal, you become a cheater, a stealer. When you get involved with an adult adultery, you are a an adulterer. Okay? Those are names that are put on us. But I am so thankful when we repent and come to the cross, Jesus forgives us and we receive a new name, right? We're forgiven. I don't know about you, but I'm thankful for that. So, a white stone with a new name written on it. Not guilty. All right, are you ready to go to the third city? Let's go to Thyatira. Say it with me. Thyatira. Thyatira. And I'm going to mispronounce that later. I just want to let you know. So, what is the revelation of Jesus to this church? These are the words of the Son of God. So, He is God whose eyes are like blazing fire. Okay, just picture it. What am I doing right now? I am staring into your soul, right? It is, have you ever watched somebody and it's like they can see right through you? The blaze, eyes of blazing fire basically means that Jesus can cut through all the, the fog and all the other stuff that we do to try to hide our sin. Jesus sees whose feet are like burnished bronze. Basically, that's talking about purity. There's no impurity in him. When he walked this earth, there was no sin in him. He was perfect. Now, let's begin to process this and think about why is Jesus saying that he sees into their soul? Why is he talking and revealing the part that he is perfect? Let's look and see. Go ahead and take notes here. He's the Son of God. His eyes like blazing fire. His feet were like burnished bronze. No impurity. Now, what were the good things that Thyatira were doing? Verse 19 says, I know your deeds, your love, your faith, your service, and your perseverance. For the sake of time, I'm going to throw those all up right there. Perseverance, love, they loved God, they loved people. They stood strong in their faith. They believed that God could do the impossible. They served other people. They helped the poor. They were persevering. That means they were suffering persecution, but they did not give up. But the one thing I want to take time to talk about today is the second, or the last part here, and that you are now doing more than you did at first. Okay? Put up the mirror for yourself right now. Can that be said of you? As in your faith, remember what you've done in the past for God. Are you doing more now or are you doing less? Are you growing in your faith or are you on a downward spiral? They were commended because they were growing in their faith. They were doing more. Doing more than they used to. But let's look at the bad of Thyatira. You tolerate that woman Jezebel. 
this is just a very direct scripture. Matter of fact, when I was studying this, I found out some of the earlier manuscripts, instead of using the word that, use the word your. Okay, so I want you to think through this with me. Are you ready? This, this may blow your mind here. You tolerate your woman. Okay, remember how we talked about to the angel of the church of Thyatira, right? That could be, that's basically a messenger, which could actually be what? The, the pastor, okay? The one in charge of that church. So if this message is to the pastor of that church, and you hear this word, you tolerate your woman, who might he be talking about? The pastor's wife. Yikes, okay? And symbolically, she is called Jezebel, somebody leading the people away. So imagine how difficult that might be. Here you might have a minister preaching the truth, and behind the scenes, his wife, calling herself a prophetess, is spreading these things. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. So before in these other churches, it's kind of like the outsiders inviting people to get involved with this. But here, you've got somebody smack right down in the middle of the church saying, hey church folks, this is okay. And I don't know how she might have spent it. You know, we're going to think about that just a little bit. But whatever, we know that she is leading the people into sexual immorality into idolatry. So go ahead and write that down. Uh, we're being generous in our, in our way we write this down. They're tolerating false prophets who entice people into idol worship and sexual immorality. Now, what is the command to this church of Thyatira? It's like the one that we saw before. Repent. The whole message is, yes, you're here right now, but you need to repent. You need to change. We're going to look at the scriptures that talk about that in a minute. But let's look at verse 24. Now I say to the rest of you in Thyatira. So those of you who have not fallen for the lies that she is speaking, who are not getting involved in the sexual immorality and the idolatry, for those of you, to you who do not hold to her teaching and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets. Okay. Can I spin something, maybe a, a theory here? You know, maybe she's, she's coming to the church and she's saying, you know, I've got a word from the Lord. The stuff that we, we have been receiving from the Bible, uh, that's, that's great. But there's some deeper things that go beyond. You know, in the beginning of time, there was not uh, just, just Jesus. You know, there was also Satan, you know. And we can learn from Jesus and we can also learn from Satan. There's some deeper truths. And yes, what you have is good here, but there is so much more if you would just open your mind to this truth. Can you see how wicked and how evil that is? And I see it today, you know. <laughs> People coming and saying, you know, a deeper truth. Uh, there's one Oprah episode, you know, that I remember, I think is it, Eckhart Tolle, I can't remember the name, but this, this deeper knowledge beyond it. And they're okay to accept Jesus, but just not Jesus alone. So whatever it is, she's leading the people astray, and she's presenting it as like, hey, I've got a, a deeper knowledge. You know, those other church folks, you know, they're okay, but they don't really get the big picture, you know, poor them. But what he says to those who are not following for that. Basically, I'm not going to impose any other burden on you. You're resisting her lies, and that's good. Here's my only command to you. Hold on to what you have until I come. Don't give up what you believe in. Stand for me, no matter what. So let's go ahead and write that down. What is the command? Repent and hold on to what you have. Now, what are the consequences if they don't? What if they give in and they follow the teaching? teachings of this Jezebel woman. Verse 21, I have given her time to repent of her immorality. 
You know what I see in that? The grace and the mercy of God. And just imagine someone trying to lead people into sin. God could have zapped them just like that. But yet, he gave her time to repent of her immorality. But she didn't want any part of it. I, I imagine there were people that talked to her. That you can't do this. Hopefully her husband, okay? But whatever it is, she resisted that. In verse 22, because she resisted that, so I will cast her on a what? Bed of suffering. And so here you see the irony or the connection, right? Because her sin involved the bed, right? Sexual immorality. And now she is going to be cast on that bed with suffering. I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely unless they repent of her ways. So imagine this being read in the church. People that were involved with her, like unless you repent, hopefully they are convicted and they repent in that moment. But if they don't, verse 23, I will strike her children dead. Now it's talking about the children. It's talking about her followers, the people who are uh, following her in her deception. Then all the churches will know that I am he who searches hearts and minds. Go back to the picture of who Jesus is. How did he reveal himself? The one with blazing eyes of fire. He sees, right? He searches the hearts and mind. He knows what's really going on. And I will repay each of you according to your deeds. Remember the burnished bronze. He was holy, but they were getting involved in wickedness. So if you're writing down the consequences, right, they will suffer intensely and they will die. Hey, encouraging word here. But that's not something that God wants. He wants them to repent. But for those who overcome, for those who repent, or for those who don't believe those lies, there is a promise to them. And we see that in verse 26. To the one who is victorious and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations. So let's write that down. And I will also give that one the morning star. So I believe that's a reference to Jesus. You know, you can go after the deep secrets of Satan. You can go after the immorality or you can go after me. All right, for the sake of time, let's go ahead and write that down. They will be given the morning star. And let's move on to our last city. This one we can say very easily because we've heard it many times. The Church of Philadelphia. Now we see this in Revelation chapter 3. We're going to cover the other two churches next week. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 7. Let's look at the picture that is given of Jesus here. These are the words of him who is holy. He's separate from us. And he is true. Who holds the key of David. David was the great what? King of Israel. What he opens, no one can shut. And what he shuts, no one can open. His authority is the final word. So if you're taking notes, he's the holy and true one. He holds the key of David, and that's speaking of a king's authority. And lastly in this, no one can open what he shuts and vice versa. Basically, no one will be able to undo his judgment. Now, let's keep that in mind as we look at what's said. Let's look at the good things for the Church of Philadelphia. He says, I know your deeds. You're doing good things. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. You know what I believe this is? This is an opportunity before them. Something that they couldn't make happen. How many of you have tried to knock down a door in your life? You're going to make this thing happen. And you just keep running up against the wall. And then there's other times that God just has this open door. And it's like, can it really be that easy? That's, that's amazing. So God had an open door before them and no one was going to stop that. So what were the good things? They did good things. Not only that, it continues and says, I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Okay, so they suffered as well. They suffered persecution, but they kept God's word and they did not know, deny his name. So let's go ahead and write those things down. 
They did good things. They kept the word of God and did not deny Christ. The last one. You have kept my command to endure patiently. Okay? So not only are they suffering. Have you ever had a bad day? There's sometimes where we can have a bad day and you don't tell anybody. Are you the type of person that has a bad day and you don't tell anybody? Anybody here? Some of you, right? Some of you can hide it. And then there's others of us, when we have a bad day, what do we do? We tell everybody about it, right? And here we are, they're enduring, but they're, they're enduring it patiently. They, knew, they know that this is part of serving Christ, that there's going to be times where they have to go through difficulty. They weren't disgruntled with the Lord during those times. They endured it patiently. Now, what is the bad that was going on in the Philadelphia church? Uh, not much, but I will say this. He says, I know that you have little strength. So maybe this is a church that needed to grow in their power and their authority of following after God and making a difference. So that's all I put there, little strength. And what is the command to the Philadelphian church? Let's look at it in verse 11. I am coming soon, so hold on to what you have. It's just like one of the messages to the other church. Don't lose your faith. So go ahead and write that down. Hold on. Now, what is the consequences if they don't hold on? Let's look in verse 11. He says, I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will do what? Take your crown. What do we learn about the crown uh, for the church of Smyrna? It was the crown of what? Life, right? Okay, so hold on so that no one will take your life, your eternal life. You will lose your crown if you give up. That's the consequence. Now, what is the promise to the overcomer? Now, remember we talked about the synagogue of Satan? We're going to see it again here in verse 9. I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan, who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but are liars... I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. So basically, those uh, Jewish people who had rejected Christ were saying of the believers, who were also Jews, they were saying, you are not really a child of God. Uh, Because you're following this Jesus, you are not really a child of God. And they were belittling them. But Jesus is saying, here's what's going to happen. One day, they're going to have to acknowledge that I have loved you. Verse 10, I will also keep you from that hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. I believe this is talking about the tribulation. Verse 12, the one who is victorious, the one who does not give up, who holds on, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will they leave it. I will write on them the name of my God the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God, and I will also write my name on them. So let's go ahead and fill this in, the promise to the overcomer. Make, he will make them a pillar in the temple. And uh, basically, I, I've said this before, I'm going to talk about Bruce. If I were to talk about our church here today, I would call Bruce a pillar of this church. Why? He's been here a long time. He's a faithful guy. He, he served in Sunday school and has done many things. And I would call him a pillar of this church. Why, why do I say that? Because he is an active part of our body and he has been a support to this body for a long time. There's many of you that I could say the same thing about. But it's a place of honor. And here's what's, what's taking place for this church. He's, if you are faithful, if you, come, if you overcome, you're going to have a place of honor in the temple of God. Wow, that's special. And you will carry the authority of God, the new city, and Jesus on you. His name will be on you, and that represents authority. Uh, Melanie, would you mind coming for just a moment? Now, I know that we have just covered four churches, and that's a lot. I, I get that. But here's what I want you to do. I want you to take your paper right now, and I want you to begin to look at it, because... Today is not a history lesson. If it's a history lesson, I have failed. If today is a mirror, then I have succeeded. And what I want you to do is begin to look at this. When you look at the church, 
of Smyrna. Are you going through some suffering in your life? In a, and are you beginning to question, God, are you real because I'm facing suffering in my life? You know, if it was me and I was reading that, I would realize that, hey, this is part of the Christian faith. I am going to go through suffering, but it's possible for me to be rich in the midst of this suffering. And, and it tells me, you know, we have it really good right now, but there's coming a time, you know, where we may be brought to court, where we may lose everything we have simply because we stand for what the Word of God says. It can happen, folks. In that day, are we going to stand strong? Will we do the right thing? And from the church of Smyrna, may we be focused on, it's not just about this life. It's about eternity. It's about that crown of life. When you look at Pergamum, Thyatira, I want you to think about the sexual immorality that's happening. There's uh, false god worship. That Basically, what I want you to think about is two things here. I want you to think about sexual immorality, and I want you to think about Jesus and... Okay, Jesus and this false doctrine or this religion. Uh, let me give you an idea. In Hinduism, if you talk to them about Jesus, they're like, that's good. That's very good. But they also have 10,000 other gods that they add to Jesus. And basically it's saying, no. Uh, the scripture says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. So if it's Jesus and all of these other things... You failed. So again, you put the mirror up. God, am I getting involved in things that I should not be doing? Am I buying into lies that are being told to me all around me? And here the point is not, uh, my goal is not to make anybody feel bad. Okay? My goal is this, what the scripture says to one word. Anybody guess what it is? Repent. Right? If you're hearing this today and it hurts... It's because God wants you to repent. Right. That is his goal. And then lastly, in the church of Philadelphia, maybe you're here today and God wants to, to challenge you. Hey, you got little strength today, but I want you to be strong. For others of you, just to follow after God because you're in a situation that is so difficult, maybe God's speaking to you one simple thing. Just hold on. Don't give up on your faith. Would you stand with me? And if you don't mind, just uh, bow your heads, close your eyes. I'm going to pray, and I'm going to ask you a question, and I want you to begin thinking about if any of these apply to you today. Lord, we thank you for your word to these four churches who are all undergoing suffering in, in their lives. They were being persecuted in some ways. And, and we first say, God, uh, we don't know really what that's all about. Uh, we are so, uh, I would say, blessed. In some ways, we are blessed because we're protected from that. But I also know that in other places where there's persecution happening, that the church is strong and the people are strong because they're relying on you. But for whatever reason, we're here in this place and we're not facing that persecution to the level of what other people are. And Lord, I just pray for us that you would correct our understanding of what following you is all about. It's not about all the stuff that you can do for us in this life. It's about loving you and it's about eternity. And, and so Lord, if there's anybody here that's disillusioned, about faith and, and like why why did this happen to me and why is all this why am I suffering like this Lord I pray that you would confront them with the scripture that you do love them but there's more than this life there is eternity and so let's stop right now if, if God is speaking to you this may be an appropriate time for you just in your own way to say to God God I, I'm sorry uh, I've treated my faith like you've got to prove yourself. But the truth is, I want to follow you even if it be to the point of death. Lord, help me to have eternity in mind. Let's move on to the other. Are you here today and you're coming to church? You say you love God, 
but you also, it's Jesus and, and you also have sexual immorality in your life. You also have, maybe you've bought into some lies of other religions and it's Jesus and. You are participating in the feasts of God and also in the feasts of this world. I'm not even going to ask you to raise your hand because it's, I'm not the one with the blazing eyes of fire. It's him. And he sees. And what is his command to you today? Repent. So if God is speaking to you right now, start with confession. Say, God, I realize that I am doing things that are wrong. I'm participating in something that is not you. And Lord, I want to turn. I, and that's what repentance means. It means changing directions. So, so what I'm not talking about today is saying you're sorry and then going back and continuing in that same pattern of doing it and sorry, doing it and sorry, sorry, sorry. No, repentance is, okay, God, I'm done with living that way. And I, from this point on, am going to follow after you. I'm going to be a participant of your feast. I'm going to take you the bread of life and I'm going to take on your characteristics, your love, your purity. I'm going to be the person that you have called me to be. I'm no longer going to be Jesus and something else. I'm going to be Jesus alone. I'm going to follow after you, God, with all that I have. God is speaking to you right now in this moment. Make that commitment to him. Now, remember we talked about some of these cities? They lived where Satan had his throne. That meant that there was extra temptation, extra pressure. And I don't want to minimize the fact that we live in a culture today that is calling out from TV to music to papers. Everywhere is calling you into sin. I don't want to minimize the difficulty that's involved but all I want to do is I want you to focus on Jesus and say, Jesus, with your help, I am going to resist sin and I'm going to follow after you. I repent, I am changing directions, and I want to follow after you. If that's your heart, I want you just to convey that to the Lord right now. Lastly, little strength. And also I think about doing more than what you've done in the past. Are you less a servant of God today than you were a year ago? Do you love God less now than you did two or three years ago? I want to call you back. Where's your fire? Where's your passion? I want you to come back. Ask God for his strength and power. And I want you to hold on with everything to him. God speaking to you in this area. Just ask him. Say, God, I need your help. I want to hold on to you. I want to follow you. I want to love you more today. I want to be operating in the power of your Holy Spirit every day of my life. I want to shine for you, Lord Jesus. If that's you, would you just make your prayer before God right now? So God, help me in that. Lord Jesus, we commit our heart to you today. And we pray that you would help us to live out our faith. Help us not to give in to evil. Help us to follow you with everything we have. In your name, Jesus.